Struck him out. Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk him up. What's up, everybody? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Daniel Starkin. It's a Friday afternoon, but we got a little bit of breaking news for the Dodgers, the free agent signing we've all been waiting for. Outfielder <laughs> David Peralta headed to Los Angeles. Jeff Passan, among others, to report a one-year, $6.5 million deal that includes incentives that could take it to $8 million. Peralta, 35-year-old left fielder, primarily. Uh, you will most likely recognize him from all of his years with Arizona. I'm going to be honest. I had no idea he finished last season with the Rays shows how <laughs> dialed I am into the, uh, to the diamondbacks day to day. But Daniel, when you see the move, obviously it's a name we recognize six and a half million is not an insignificant amount of money. Give me your immediate reaction to this one. Well, my re my immediate reaction is I've been so caught up in Lakers stuff and the and the NBA trade deadline and everything that I forgot that the MLB offseason is technically still going on. I feel like it's been a while since any moves have been made. So yeah. uh, caught me by surprise. But um, I, I think overall, I think it's a solid signing. I think when you look at, you know, the current state of the Dodgers outfield, there's a lot of question marks there. Like, obviously, you got Mookie Betts in right field. That's not a question mark. But outside of that, your options are Chris Taylor, who's coming off the worst season of his career. Trace Thompson, who's coming off the best season of his career, but he also doesn't have any sort of track record beyond that. Um, and then you got the young guys like, you know, James Outman. Um, you know, maybe M Miguel Vargas was going to be out there some. But, you know, as a whole, there's not there's no one you could count on to say, yeah, we're going to put him out there and he's going to give us, you know, really good production like that. You could just bank it. So I, I think this is just another guy to add to the mix. I'm not expecting Peralta to be an all-star or anything by any means, but he's a left-handed bat who, um, you know, makes for a natural pl platoon with guys like, you know, Taylor or, um, or Trace Thompson. So, um, I, I like it. I, I'm not over the moon by any means, but but I like the signing. It's not too much money. So, you know, why not? Yeah, look, they're over the luxury tax. So that's not a problem at this point, which means exactly like you said, who cares? Like six and a half million dollars. It's a one year deal. There's no such thing as a bad one year deal. And if you look at the Dodgers outfield at this point, let's just throw another dart there. And, and this is the most expensive dart that they're throwing. But um, I do have to mention, you forgot former all-star Jason Hayward in the mix out there in the outfield, Daniel. So well, I don't, I don't know if this signing bodes well for, for his chances of making the roster. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to that point, like there were so many question marks, like we knew Taylor was probably going to play a lot because of the way they've structured the infield. He's probably going to see most, if not all of his time in the outfield. Aside from Taylor, you mentioned it. Thompson is around, but has had one outlier positive season. And that was last year. Some of the underlying metrics don't necessarily lend themselves to believe that that's going to continue. You've got James Outman, who's done it in like a four game sample size at the major league level. Some places have him as a top 100 prospect, but not exactly somebody you can just pencil in to 140 productive games. And, and then you've got a bunch of minor league reclamation projects like the Jason Haywards. And so I like this signing for the Dodgers because this, this to me is a floor raiser. It's not a ceiling raiser. It's a floor raiser. And you look at some of his numbers. This is a guy, each of the last two seasons, 1.7 wins above replacement. That's a solid player. That's better than, than you could probably pencil in from the guys um, that they had already. You look at some of the stat cast stuff, 75th percentile average exit velocity, 89th percentile max exit velocity. Defensive metrics are all flawed. He was 88th percentile and outs above average in left field which is a nice thing. At least you might be getting some competent defense. But I think the key is what you mentioned. It's the platoon splits against right-handed hit against right-handed pitching. Excuse me. 116 weighted runs created plus last year for Peralta. Aside from 2021 and 2016, he has been well above average to 11% or more above average against right-handed pitchers every year since 2014. Uh, against lefties has not been as good. He's been below average every year of his career. So throw this guy in there against righties, which is most pitchers throw him in against righties. He's going to give you competent play in left field. And then he's going to give you an above average bat. It seems like maybe the Dodgers unlock some things a la AJ Pollock, and it becomes even more productive. But 
That's how I'm seeing it. Now, my question to you on the back of all that, Daniel, is who does this hurt the most? Because it feels like if Peralta's going to get two-thirds, if not three-quarters of the starts in left field, I would imagine that Chris Taylor's a guy that's going to be seeing a lot of center field then. So what does that mean for James Outman and Trace Thompson? Well, you, you asked me who it's going to hurt the most. I think you just named the two guys, and and my condolences to you. I know you're leading the Outman train here all off season, so um, naturally he's probably going to be the guy who who loses out just because they're both left handed bats. I know Outman's a better defender, especially like he could play center field. You're not going to stick David Peralta in center field, um, but I mean Peralta's probably going to be like you said, he's going to be your left fielder against right handed pitching. Um, which means that James Outman's going to get less playing time and Trace Thompson's going to get less playing time. And and I know it's – we're kind of – I feel like more so than ever we're going to go into spring training as with kind of competitions for these jobs. Like I don't think, um, you know, the left field and, and center field jobs in particular, like they're not set in stone. So if, if one of these guys comes out and has a monster spring training, then that's probably going to give him the edge. But I, th- I think Peralta's track record – um, is good enough that he's he's going to get playing time like six and a half million with eight million like can get to eight million incentives like that's not nothing like it's not like you're just signing him to ride the bench and maybe you cut him if he sucks like that's that's not nothing so I think yeah. he's going to get a lot of playing time and I think Thompson and Outman are probably going to lose out yeah I, I tend to agree because again you just follow the money Peralta has now a six and a half million dollar commitment Chris Taylor, we know that the financial commitment is there and how much they believe in and trust him. So it does feel like Thompson and Outman are now on the outside looking in. The caveat there is there's going to be plenty of at-bats to go around. Yeah. I think it's not to say that Outman and Thompson are just going to be riding the bench six days out of seven, but they're not going to be the lead guys in a platoon barring injury. I will say I will be so curious to see how they handle Chris Taylor. You mentioned it coming off his worst offensive season, but not just that, like a really, really bad, atrocious offensive season, 93 weighted runs created plus um, 220 batting average, 304 on base, 373 slug. So if he can't turn that around, I'm not saying it's like, I think the leash will be long, but him, I think his job is probably more in jeopardy than Peralta's job, the way that this has played out. Because Peralta has been consistent. He gives you a little bit, defensively in left field there's a natural hey against righties he's in left field like do you agree with that 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 Peralta is maybe the most predictable of the four remaining outfielders if we're counting Taylor Peralta Outman and Thompson I I think I think that's a perfect way to put it like I feel like you could pretty much you know pencil in the stats you're gonna get out of Peralta like he's gonna be a slightly above average hitter not a ton of power but some power um, and, and you just kind of know what you're going to get out of him. Like the other guys are all kind of question marks. Like if, if Chris Taylor comes out and is an all-star next season, the way he was two years ago, like, I don't think either of us would be surprised, but yeah. like you just said, he's coming off a really bad season. So we wouldn't be surprised if that gets replicated either, especially with his high strikeout rate. Like that's something that's been a thing his whole career. It's not like that just popped up last season or anything. So um, I, I think that's fair to say. I also think the one thing that Chris Taylor does have going for him is obviously his versatility. Like yeah. he, Peralta is a guy who's going to play left field and that's pretty much it. Like maybe right field a day or like a, two or three times a year when Mookie gets a day off. But other than that, he could only really play left field. Chris Taylor could play all over. So if there's, if there's an injury in the infield, like if Gavin Lux gets injured, maybe Chris Taylor comes and plays more infield. If Max Muncy gets injured, you know, et cetera. So I I think Chris Taylor has that going for him, but I definitely think Peralta is a guy that you could kind of pencil in and know what you're going to get out of him. And on a team where you have some superstars, you have some, some question marks. I think having a guy like that, who is is solid, not great, obviously, but solid. I I think that's a guy who can, you know, help contribute. And that's something that for six and a half million bucks, when you're already over the luxury tax, like it ain't changing much there. So why not? Yeah, and I think the Taylor point you make is a good one, and I'll land it there. I think what Peralta does weirdly is he gives the Dodgers insurance everywhere because now you don't need Chris Taylor to be an everyday outfielder necessarily. And so what happens if Gavin Lux underperforms? Miguel Vargas can't handle second base. One of those guys gets injured. Obviously, Miguel Rojas is going to be the first one in, but what happens if Max Muncy doesn't bounce back? I mean, we're talking about Taylor's offensive profile. 
Muncie in a similar boat. I think we all feel way more confident in Muncie figuring it out than Taylor. But now you have insurance. Now Chris Taylor, it's not like, oh, crap, we need Chris Taylor in the outfield because we have a ton of questions. It's we'd like Chris Taylor in the outfield. I think the best case scenario from the Dodgers front office perspective is Vargas hits and fields well enough to play second. Lux hits and fields well enough to play short. Peralta hits and fields well enough to play left. And Taylor hits and fields well enough to play center. I think that's the best case scenario. But yep. what this does is it gives you options. Optionality, that's the, the Andrew Friedman buzzword. But now if Muncie gets hurt and Vargas can't cut it, Rojas and Taylor can both play on the infield. And then you've got Peralta in left. And now it's Outman or Thompson in center field. I think that's kind of the piece. You're not dependent upon Chris Taylor absolutely needing to fill one of those two outfield spots. I think it gives you a little more flexibility. You'd like him to, but it gives you flexibility. Does that make sense? I think it makes perfect sense. I think that's something we've seen the Dodgers value a lot, like the versatility, guys being able to move around, like uh, platoons we've seen a lot from the Dodgers, and and this yeah. is a guy who fits that mold. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'll say this. Six and a half million bucks, if Outman is tearing the cover off the ball, if Trace Thompson is replicating what he did last year, you can bench six and a half million bucks and not even think twice about it. It's you could like also you probably look to trade him at the yeah. deadline too. Like you're obviously not going to get a lot, but you, you mentioned you didn't remember it, but Arizona yeah. had him on an expiring deal last year and they traded him to the Rays at the deadline. So that's a pot, like, that would be best case scenario. I'd say like if Outman becomes a star and you don't yeah. need Peralta that you could trade him. Uh, that'd be great. I'm not expecting that to be the case, but like, like we've been, just been saying, it just gives you a, you know, a ton of options. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, Dodgers signed David Peralta, six and a half million for one year incentives that can take that deal to 8 million. The 35 year old probably penciling himself into two thirds of the starts in left field. If everything goes right, let us know what you guys think in the comments below. As always, check out dodgerblue.com. We'll have a full write up of that. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube and on our YouTube page, Dodger Blue 1958. Ring the notification bell because if there is any press conferences or coverage, of it we will have those videos for you check out dodger blue 1958 on social media as well we appreciate you joining us regular season or excuse me spring training right around the corner pitchers and catchers reporting very very soon which is exciting then regular season uh not too far away so that's daniel i'm jeff thanks for joining us as always go dodgers